Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce you to a digital humanities project here that is led by Professor Jacobo Meyerston, and which I've had the honor of participating in and supporting both as an historian of philosophy who's interested in the subject area, but also as the director of the classical studies program here in the Institute for Arts and Humanities. Uh, the project so far has resulted in employing six undergraduate students as interns, supported by generous grants from the Academic Senate of UCSD, the Classical Studies Program, and the Center for Hellenic Studies. Uh, and what we're doing is at once teaching these students how to read ancient Greek. We're teaching them about social science and network theory and computing or coding. Jacobo is actually teaching all of them all of these things simultaneously. And we hope to eventually expand it into classroom exercises and build what we're calling assembly lines of knowledge. Now, this is all actually very traditional. If you consider briefly the history of digital humanities and specifically the history of classics and computing. So classics is one of the earliest, greatest, and most successful proponents of digital humanities projects. And I'm thinking here specifically of the thesaurus Thesaurus Lingua Graecae, a digital library of Greek literature, which was founded by Marianne MacDonald at the time in 1972, a graduate student at the University of California, Irvine, but later a professor of theater here at UC San Diego and presently an emerita professor. As a result of the project that she initiated, the TLG project has now digitized all Greek literary texts from Homer through Byzantine literature in the 15th century AD. And we can put this all on one CD-ROM, or if you don't know what that is anymore, uh, it, it's, easily, it, it, it's easy to access on the internet. And so we can do things like perform searches of any Greek word and determine the frequency in the total data set of Greek uh, literature and find every occurrence of it and so forth. This has revolutionized the field of classics and all of these subsequent um, data mining technologies and, and methods of doing digital humanities have essentially descended from that project. Now, our uh, project focuses on Diogenes Laertius, who's a very obscure Greek writer. And I say obscure because we don't even know when he existed. We think probably the third century AD, and we don't even know if his name is supposed to be Diogenes Laertius or Laertius Diogenes. And we don't know where he was from, but he wrote one of the most famous and most important documents in the whole history of philosophy, his ways of life of the eminent and famous Greek philosophers. This work contains biographies of the philosophers, descriptions of their opinions or doxographies, transmission of ancient lists of their writings, and reports of other facts about them. In fact, his own text is a kind of archaic cultured data symposium where he's brought together from various sources a bunch of data on previous philosophers, which he's attempting to preserve and convey to later, uh, to, to later writers and enthusiasts of philosophy. And we have lost the works of basically 99% of Greek antiquity and 99% of Greek philosophy. And Diogenes Laertius is our only source for a sizable number of people that he talks about. And then he's the best source for some other people. And this is despite his own limitations as a philosopher. It's just the fact that his work was copied continually from antiquity to the present day or into the age of printing that we're still able to consult his work. Now, he preserves precious anecdotes for us, like that Empedocles died by jumping into an erupting volcano of Mount Etna, uh, and, a, and a precious dialogue between Diogenes of Sinop of, and Plato, where Diogenes of Sinop said, uh, hey, Plato, I see a cup here, but I don't see the form of the cup that you keep talking about. And Plato said something like, Oh, Diogenes, that's because eyes with which you could see a cup you have, but mind with which you would see the form of the cup you have not. And precious other things like reporting about how Diogenes used to walk around Athens in broad daylight with a lit lantern. And when people said, what the hell are you doing? He said, 
I'm looking for an honest and actual human being somewhere. Now, he provides hundreds or thousands of such anecdotes, but he also provides the following kind of information that is useful for us to look at. Geographic facts about philosophers, like their birthplace, travels, time of death. Student-teacher relationships among philosophers. Relationships of being guests or friends among philosophers. Uh, relationships of being family members or lovers among philosophers. Reader-critic relationships among philosophers. Correspondent interlocutor relationships among philosophers. And benefactor-client relationships among philosophers. Now, here's the new critical edition of the Greek text of Diogenes Laertius. It's a huge work. And here's the most recent translation published by Oxford University Press. And we first teach students how to utilize these technologies, which are actually quite advanced compared to the papyrus that the work was originally composed on. And these are like computers for us to be able to use indexes and in a convenient codex form and so on. So we teach this technology first, and then we build on top of that this other technology that we're about to introduce. Now, for the most part, Laertius's text has been chopped up, scoured, and sifted, or mined, if you will, for testimonia or reports and fragments of the early Greek philosophers, Socratics, classical philosophers, and Hellenistic philosophers. This is the method that was developed in the 19th century of source criticism, so reconstructing lost works and so forth based on testimony in later authors who actually possessed the works that we no longer have. But Jacobo's idea is that we can extract a different kind of information from Laertius, not by focusing analytically on the fragments themselves and isolated philosophical claims, but instead discerning a more synthetic account of the interrelationships that are described in the work, which constitute a kind of image of ancient intellectual networks, an image which can be represented in both temporal and spatial dimensions. So I hand it over to Jacobo to show how, how, how we've done this. Um, yeah. Well, I am lucky that I have uh, Monty to talk for me, and <laughs> so I say the seven minutes of the frame. Yeah. Um, so the it was really interesting um, since I work uh, in Greece, but also I work um, in outside Greece. So I deal with uh, documents from Mesopotamia and uh, Egypt. I've been always uh, interested in the question of uh, how philosophy came to be in Greece, right? Philosophy came to be in different places. But um, so the theory has been always that philosophy is an invention of the Greeks. It only happened there. And um, that um, nobody, they didn't borrow any um, information from any anywhere else. And I saw that this book, it could be a source to go beyond that and see what actually was the social structure that was uh, below uh, the formation of uh, Greek philosophy, or at least the beginning of social and investigation. So um, this is one of the, the main questions that motivated uh, me to, to start with this. And the other um, part was that I wanted to learn some computer science. And I had spent a lot of time translating from Greek into first into German uh, when I was learning German uh, because um, um, I, well, it was in my language, but I went to Germany to learn Greek and then Akkadian, which was the language of, uh, of Mesopotamia, and then so on until I came here to teach do, uh, these things. And um, so I, I was uh, th it was uh, thinking I need to learn something new, and I, went, I wanted to learn how to program and social network theories and so on, and this was the text to um, help me to do that But while I was teaching my students and I, well, I was trying to discover what is uh, at the foundation of the construction of social system, like philosophy. So this text of uh, Diogenes begins refuting the idea that Greek philosophy came from the East. So he engaged in the prologue of that book saying, Greek philosophy is Greek, and then the Greeks did not learn or take anything from the Persians, from the Babylonians, from the Egyptians, and so on. So with using his data, um, we started uh, looking into so to visualize um, the movements of the, the philosophers in, in space, right? Um, and um, although he was refuting that they were bringing information from outside the network, 
And the travels he's describing show that these philosophers actually had a really high degree of mobility. So many of them spent time in Egypt, in Syria. Um, some of them went to the West and to Libya and so on. And they, he also reports people going even as far as India. So his prologue is contradicted by what he's presenting later on in the book. And uh, we were reading the text with the students. The students were uh, extracting relationships between people. We were coding the text with a special software to do that. And uh, in the future, we want to move to more uh, machine learning extraction of these kind of things. But this is the map we are getting right now at the beginning of the investigation. And we're showing that these networks were uh, quite complex uh, in terms of how they were distributed um, across um, space. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to um, look at was, if this is true that as many historians of philosophy say that philosophy began in Greece because they had a democratic system. And the democratic system that they had allowed them to have this free discussion and to develop um, a critical uh, consciousness. But now, since we know that philosophy emerged in other places where um, they, was not, uh, they were not democratically organized and that most of uh, European philosophy, actually, and science take place in, non, in a non-democratic um, historical time, for example, under the rulership of kings and sponsorship of um, dukes and so on. So this theory that actually democracy was related to the emergence of philosophy was somehow dubious, and I was suspecting that maybe social network theory could help me uh, to, to um, um, describe social structure in a different way. And uh, here, social structure expands, obviously, outside Greece and incorporates uh, other populations. <clears throat> so since we are in the humanities and people in the humanities do not, cannot use social network uh, analysis software, we design an interface. So I use, uh, I program this uh, learning R that allow me to um, build these things. Uh, it took a lot of my time, but uh, I finally made it, and for you may look like a very, na very naive, especially if we have uh, engineers here. But uh, um, it's like I am in second year of uh, computer science, so even lower than that. Um, but then um, I can also, it happens that I can do a lot of stuff with the things that we're developing. I can calculate centrality measures of these places, for example, and um, in other things. So this is the, the first implementation. What we did was, was the map. And then soon we move to actually visualize the networks that we were um, extracting from the text. Um, it's just kind of slow. Um, and we, our, of course, this is an overlap of different networks uh, based on different types of relationships that we can, uh, for now, um, explore independently. And uh, we use um, also, in my naivete, um, different types of uh, um, ways to measure uh, centrality. And we've actually found a few interesting things um, in, this, um, in this data. So one of the things that actually um, is one of the most interesting parts of that is that we run some algorithms and identifying um, uh, communities of philosophers uh, from the data that we were extracting. And uh, the different algorithms uh, create different groups. So, th so these uh, community search algorithms uh, find different groups that do not overlap with what we have in uh, the history of philosophy. So when you look into the history of philosophy, you will find that um, they are the followers of Plato, of Aristotle, the Stoics, and so on. But the computer finds something completely different. And uh, that opens um, a lot of questions for us, uh, very interesting ones. Sometimes there are mistakes in the coding, sometimes there are mistakes of programming, but they all let us to think even more about um, this uh, situation. <clears throat> so I'm gonna leave um, you with uh, Monty and um, a problem that we found um, coming out of the data. That was that uh, we discovered that a philosopher who we did not know anything about was more central or more important in the network of philosophers uh, than uh, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, or any of them. 
So, Monty, do you want to explain why just, you... Just very, just very briefly, so we hadn't uh, heard of this character Stilpo, or hadn't heard it very often, and so we started thinking, why, why does he appear so central in these networks? And so we started doing deeper and deeper research into him and realized that he had influenced uh, the founder of Stoicism, and he had influenced the founder of Peronian skepticism, and so this had massive follow-on. Uh, uh, this had big follow-on effects, and we think we can, so we're writing an article now called uh, The Vindication of Stilpo, uh, because even though none of his works survive, it, we think we can demonstrate through this kind of mathematical analysis of data that his influence was incredibly extensive, and then as, as we research further into him in sources like Cicero and Seneca, we heard them actually describing and saying, and the greatest of all of these was Stilpo, and he did this, and he had these influences, and things that really hadn't been noticed and not at all worked into traditional histories of philosophy. So we find a kind of surprising result. Well, this is one of the things that is uh, coming up in this preliminary uh, um, approach. So we plan uh, in the next year to implement um, some coding that will extract the information automatically from the text. We're not gonna use the students to code uh, every single word in the text. And uh, that would allow us to run our search engine through this uh, relative big uh, um, corpus of data that you can fit in a CD-ROM, but actually contains the whole work of Plato, Aristotle, all the historians, and so on. And um, in the future, we'll also introduce um, a description of um, networks of lovers, because we also find out uh, was, while we were doing this that many of these philosophers actually were lovers. And uh, when they changed from one school to another, what happened is that they were changing partners. And this is the kind of things that do not appear in the history of philosophy at all. Right? <laughs> well, thank you very much.